Hey everybody, welcome to another episode of the OIG Roundtable. Uh, we're short one soldier, but the battle shall continue on as we wage our war in the fraud, waste, abuse, and compliance world. I've got Matt Kachansky, director of our SIU team, the retired Northeast UPIC director and retired executive from HHS OIG. I've got Wade McFall, a member of our SIU investigative team, retired ASAC from HHS OIG out of the LA office. Jason Osgarin is on much needed PTO and is gonna be out for the next few weeks. And we've got brand new backgrounds. It's very sexy. <laughs> it's good stuff. It's good stuff. So only retired executives wear collars, I guess. That's a true story. I think that's, <laughs> I think that's a true story, but it is, it is successful time. So Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being part of it. Uh, today's podcast, we want to talk about uh, the introduction, the implementation, the use of technology as it relates to your SIU as part of having a modern SIU that is based upon technology related platforms. In today's climate, it's very difficult to operate an SIU without having some form of technology. And that could be something as simple as Excel spreadsheets or access databases or things of that sort. Um, and so different, you know, different plans are going to have different needs. Um, if, you know, if you don't need a Ferrari, you shouldn't have a Ferrari. If you need a lawnmower, you should have a lawnmower. And you certainly shouldn't have a Ferrari with a lawnmower engine, right? You shouldn't have something that has a lot of bells and whistles, but you know, still gets the job done as you need it. And so a little bit of it winds up being that if you overexpend your time and effort and energy and your costs on technology, you sometimes run into a situation where you're getting over delivery of the things that you need. And it's a need versus wants. And, and I think from a technology perspective, we're talking really about two different things. We're talking about case managers, we're talking about analytic tools. The number one on the analytic tool is, you know, if you go to any of these conferences, the NHCAA, NAMPI, uh, CFE conferences, any of these conferences, what you see is in the vendor area, there are a ton of vendors that are in the analytic space. And each one of those tools have some unique characteristics that they believe sets them apart from the other tool. And all of them have their pluses and their minuses. Uh, we vetted about six or eight, maybe more analytic tools uh, when we were choosing how we were going to proceed with our analytics. And uh, there are a lot of challenges and you got to find the sweet spot for you. And some of that sweet spot is going to be a combination of cost, ease of use, and results-driven analytics, right? And what you don't want is a situation where you're spending all of this money on an analytic tool and it's producing more work than you're able to to deal with too many leads. So, you know, Wade, I want to start with you because you know, you've, you've experienced that in a lot of places, right? At the OIG, we got way more referrals than we could ever work with. Um, from the uh, from the medic perspective, when you were on the medic contract, you you know you're getting tons and tons of leads and work, and you're seeing it now that uh, being able to manage or throttle those leads and meeting those expectations are important pieces of being able to manage the ROI, being able to manage the generation of leads, and not finding a situation where you've got. 30 leads a month coming in and you can only handle right one or two um so some of the some of the things in thinking about technology are going to be some of those end user expectations right <clears throat> yeah and and just like you said we talked about this earlier too i think something that often gets kind of overlooked is kind of the, the human element i think matt brought that up too um so you, you don't want to like get the cart in front of the horse really especially when it comes to generating these leads because for and kind of like what you said so say in the in invest the investigator bandwidth of your unit is maybe you have 10 investigators say 20 cases each we often talk about what's the right caseload and i'll probably hit on that a little bit but if you do 10 investigators with 20 cases each that's 200 cases so like you were saying don't don't pay for the analytics folks to be generating 600 referrals if you can't address them you're going to have to you know you can only work a certain percentage of them in it but that doesn't mean only pay for the 200 that you're going to work because you have to vet them you have to triage them and you want to you know we always talk about roi you're going to want to go for the cases that are a little higher dollar amount um so you you don't want to spend you know 
time working one thousand two thousand dollar cases if you can spend that extra time with those other leads that you're not going to be able to work but try and basically filter them out to get the highest dollar the highest value cases um but going back to the bandwidth situation <clears throat> You know, you, you have to look at the different types of cases, the investigator experience. So maybe some investigators can only handle 10 cases effectively. Some might be able to handle 30 or 40, but I've I've heard different um, SIUs where people have 50 and 60 cases assigned to them. And it, unless they're just pushing paper, not really investigating, um, it's just too much because you're going to get, it's another ROI killer where the investigators are just spinning their wheels. They can't keep up with the cases. It turns to burnout, frustration. You know, people are going to, they don't have job satisfaction. That it, There's going to be more turnover, which is another ROI killer because now you have to hire somebody and you have, you know, two or three months at least where there's like the learning curve where the other investigator who left because you assigned them 60 cases is now gone and there's just like a dead spot there. So I think a lot of that can go back to really thinking about what do you really want for leads you don't you don't want you know so many that you can't afford to address them because you're you're basically paying for those in by volume so if you're if you're getting if you need 200 and you're getting 600 you're paying for an extra 400 to boil it down very simplistically so those those resources could go from paying for analytics you're not going to use to maybe another FTE as an investigator. So it's just, a, I think you have to look at the high level, big picture. So you're not, as you said, overspending on an analytics tool that's more than you need, basically. Yeah, I mean, part of that is gonna be deciding if you've got a budget of X number of dollars, is that budget better spent on an FTE or is it better spent on a Ferrari tool? And you might find yourself in a position where you can spend substantially less money on your tool, which would give you bandwidth to be able to hire an extra body to deal with all of the extra cases that are that are coming in because we see that all the time. And some of these tools are inordinately expensive. So, you know, part of the impetus was um, outside of the fact that in the newsletter, we we're talking about technology in this in, in, in the Friday newsletter, but also we spoke to uh, a plan that we are, uh, you know, engaged in conversations uh, with to do some business with them. And this is a super small plan. It's two, two members of the SIU um, and they're struggling to keep up with their reactive cases. And then you throw in the issue of having to do proactive cases and then spending the money on um, doing those. And then you run into this th that entire issue of, of bandwidth. The other thing I want to bring up with you, Wade, before we go on to Matt on this is sometimes the learning curve on the tool is a little bit higher and that's an ROI killer because if your investigators are having to spend a lot of time learning how to use the tool and then having to constantly be retrained or constantly having questions, right? That's downtime from using the analytics tool versus doing it. And I know, you know, you've seen a lot of the tools that are out there, right? And, you know, for me, the <clears throat> issue is if it's taking me days and days and days to figure out how to use this tool, then maybe it's not the right tool for us because even very computer savvy people still have a learning curve on where to point and click what they need. And you know, you've you've seen a lot of these tools and have experienced some of those trial and tribulations. That can be a huge ROI killer. Yeah, and I think it's you know sometimes you're going to have different levels of experience with data. You might have somebody who's like a statistician or somebody who's who's more formally educated, you know, in today's data analytics tools. Uh, some of us older guys who didn't even have computers back in the, the early 90s. I mean, today's, you know, whatever the Gen X Xers or whatever had a lot more experience. So maybe, maybe you have to look at it like part of your staff would get more use out of the the more advanced functions and that's fine that, that they're there but you have to have you can't have the the old guys trying to keep up with the the statisticians of today so there has to be different like levels of use and you so you can't have a guy like me trying to keep up and learn the same functions that somebody who's really computer savvy or data savvy can do so as long as the the tool has like different levels of operational ability. I think you're OK as long as it's not like everybody has to get up to speed with with the guys in the data squad, because that's just 
that, that that's where you start spinning your wheels again and frustration and ROI killer again. So as long as it can do a couple different levels, I think you're okay because you may have users who can who can really you know use all the tools of it, but it, it has to be available for different levels too. Yeah. So Matt, I want to I want to turn to you because one of the things that clearly comes up is are these tools being used as tools or are they being used as weapons of mass destruction for the payment integrity team? And the fact that uh, you can get stuck by uh, paralysis by analysis. Um, and in that same vein, are the leads that you're getting commensurate with the ability of the unit to, to use those leads, right? Yeah. And when we talk about this, some of this comes down to, and, and Wade kind of brought it up, which is, What's the right number of cases for an investigator? We get asked that all the time. We've we've had that come up multiple times on some of our SIU process improvement uh, projects and things of that sort. But the question of what's the right number of cases? And the answer is there is no right number of cases because different investigators have different skill sets, different ability. But tool versus weapon versus ROI and you know, like, for example, when we were talking to the one plan yesterday, they're looking for kind of a minimal number of referrals per year or per month because they've got so many reactive cases. And we see this with some of our plans who have tools where they're getting an inordinate number of leads that they could never address, no matter how many staff they have, which then becomes a management issue. We're paying for a tool we can't use. And that's where you've got this weaponization issue. Yeah, I'm going to do my best Jason Eisengrind imitation and say <laughs> it's all resource management. Uh, and it is. It, you, you bring in a new tool you and you study its capabilities. The one thing it's going to do, it's going to change your organization. It's going to change how you do your work. And it's not just investigators you have to deal with here. You know, those cases that are generated they're also going to generate medical reviews. So if you're getting an influx of cases that need more medical reviews, you have to also take into account you know, the caseloads of the of the CPCs or the nurses that are doing those reviews, as well as the investigators. Because you know at some point along that pipeline, those cases are going to hit those people too. So when you are gauging the type of tool you want and the volume of need and volume of cases or leads you want to generate from that, you've got to look at your organization as a whole, figure out how you want it structured. As Wade said, some people can use it. Some people have more trouble because of their experience. You know, do you want to have people just dedicated to doing the leads and then handing them over to the investigators and handing them over to the medical review? However you want to do it, you have to best create your organization to fit the tool that you believe is going to bring you the most benefit. So you can't just take that that tool, stick it in there and keep things the same and expect better results. It's a tool and you've got to learn how to use it and you've got to be able to adapt to having that tool in your arsenal. It, now, it's a little bit it's a little like a discussion of insanity, right? I mean, it's yeah. the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and hoping for a different outcome, but you know, the, the thing that I always see, and, and we see this with one particular client where they're getting an unbelievable number of leads per day or per week or per month, however you look at it. And I don't think that they fully understood that that's what they were getting. And I don't think that they fully understood that from their vendor who wasn't giving them the full story of what this was going to you know result in. <laughs> And so they're they're actually in a bit of a pickle, right? Because they're spending a lot of money on a tool that's producing more leads they could ever possibly get to. And that becomes a managerial issue, right? Because now, hey, we're paying for this. You're not getting to these leads. Uh, you know, what do you have to do? And that's why I think for us, one of the things that we're doing on some of our in-house data analytics is saying to our clients, what works for you? Yeah. And, and that gets to the weaponization. You know, you've spent, as an organization, you've spent X number of dollars to bring this tool in, get your people trained up in it, and have it ready to generate whatever leads. And you want to see results. Sometimes you want to see results too quickly, and you ask, you know, for tons of leads to be generated, and they're given out. And that's when the weaponization of your other side of the equation your case tracking or case indices, case management tool comes into effect because through those tools, you get dashboards, you get metrics 
reports and you can start looking at those things saying, well, look, this investigator's got 26 cases. They're still in lead status. He has, they haven't moved those forward. This one is stuck in medical review for, for four months. Why is that? And, and you start just, and the, the tool then becomes the manager. You know, they're just using those numbers to manage the organization instead of getting to the, is my romantic side, the human side of it, where let's take a look at all of the changes that have occurred in this organization. Let's look at the individual factors that are going into the reasons behind those numbers. You know, is it because they got 15 new leads on the same day because the lead generator kicked those out? Or is it because all of their cases hit at the same time. They got the medical request le letters out. All the all the records came in on the same time, so they bombarded the medical review staff. All of those things have to be taken into account when you're managing the organization and not relying on the tool itself to be your manager. Well, and and another piece of that that sometimes gets lost in the sauce is that when you are getting all of those leads generated through a data analytics tool, you still have to log them in and track them as something, yep. even if you decide to close them. So you've got to still, you get if you get 10 leads a day, 15 leads a month, whatever that number is, you still have to have somebody review the lead, yep. vet the lead, do a little bit of background, input it into some tracking system, even if it's just an Excel spreadsheet with a disposition. And if in the worst case scenario, and I say worst case, because in the worst case, all of those leads generated are actionable, right? Always keeping in mind that a lead is intelligence and that you've got to then decide, is this actionable intelligence or is it something that should be closed? Actionable intelligence needs means that it needs to be further vetted, reviewed, investigated. So you've got that extra piece of the puzzle where it's okay if you're generating those leads if you've got somebody who can spend their time to review them, make those assessments. And the problem is, is that in the, the not the, pro the problem is a small payer problem. The big plans don't have this problem because they have the financial resources to be able to deal with these things, right? Even put your UPIC hat on. At the UPIC, there was a, there was a, team, right? There was a team of people who did nothing but review leads. There was a team of yep. people who vetted the leads. There was a team of people who did nothing but respond to requests for information, right? There yep. were teams that did all of that. Yes. Larger plans have that ability, the BUCA plans, right? The big blues and, and the like have the ability to do that. But we're really looking to talk to plans that are in that Kind of hundred thousand or less, forty thousand, thirty thousand, right? Yeah. Some of our some of our SIU plans are four and five thousand. The plan we just talked to last night is a forty thousand member regional plan, and they don't have those resources. I always jokingly say that those small plans, the the people that work in the payment integrity of those plans, at the end of the day, they take off their payment integrity SIU hat and they put on maybe a compliance hat. Or they put on, you know, I always always joked that some of the smaller plans, the SIU director at the end of the day is the person taking out the garbage and vacuuming the floors because people are wearing these multiple hats and you can only wear so many hats in a given day. And so you you tend to get very lost. That. We see that with a lot of our, our plans. So you you have to be able to know if you're getting a tool, what are the expectations of that analytic tool? And are those expectations going to be ROI killers or are they going to be managerial nightmares where it's now been weaponized, right? Yeah, uh, yeah when, uh, you know, one of the one of the solutions that, you know, organizations and SIUs come up with when they get one of these tools and they get they get busier, they get more more things coming in the door is, Let's set some timeliness metrics on things. They've got to get these things from this stage to this stage to this stage within X number of days. And again, they tend to forget the human element of all of the vagaries of each investigation that caused delays and, and all that in, in the process of an investigation. You tend to say, I've got this tool. It should be more efficient. 
So we should be get, get these things done in six months. And in that six months, break it up into these processes and everything should flow perfectly. It never does because there are just so many variables outside the control of any individual investigator or, or, or CPC or nurse or data analyst that cause delays in all of those processes. So if you use the tool as your only management oversight implement, implement it's not going to work. It's a tool. Use it, but you have to still be the manager and the leader of this thing to make sure that that tool is working for you and not being used against your staff. Yeah, that's a, that's a super important piece. So wait, I want to go to you for the last word as we get ready to wrap up because it, it because part of this conversation has to include sort of that overall feeling of needs versus wants. And, you know, as an as an end user, there are things that you're going to need and there are things that you would want, but you have to weigh those out <clears throat> regarding things like ROI killers. If you've got a tool where you've got all of your needs, but then there's a hundred wants that are in there, that just complicates the process and makes it a little bit more of a challenge from an end user perspective, because at some point someone might say, hey, why aren't you doing X, Y, Z within the analytic or the case management tool? Because there's a million wants and those are beyond the needs. And it becomes part of that ROI killer because you're spending your time becoming an expert in a tool for a bunch of things that you may not need. Yeah, I mean, I think, like you say, the, the wants are, would be nice to have depending on you know, the tool and how many bells and whistles it has. But as long as the the needs that need to be there in order to you know, push the case through the various stages and to a, a recovery or whatever the end the end result is. Maybe it's a referral, but it seems like we, we worry less about referrals and more about recoveries as far as ROI. But as long as it has the tools that it needs to do that, and again, those are the needs, the wants are just, I guess, gravy on top if if there are some some of those bells and whistles that that help with the process. But you you obviously the needs take 100% priority and priority over a want. So that gets to the point that when you're vetting any of these possible vendors, for me, one of the top questions I'm going to be asking is, what's my ability to customize this tool to either achieve that ROI that I need by not having a bunch of things I don't need, and by customizing this, does it wind up costing me more money, right? Because someone will come back and say, well, if you want this customized, we have to get the developers involved and we have to do this, we have to do that. And so, yeah, you've, it, part of this is this cost containment premise is, you know, you need a tool that does what it needs to do, but you've got to do it in a cost effective manner. And some of the things I think for people to consider are, are there setup costs involved in deploying your analytic or case management tool? And if there are setup costs, what are those costs? And can those costs be either offset or can those costs be uh, deferred through a payment plan? You know, we've seen some instances where startup costs were very little. We've seen instances where startup costs were very high implementation and things of that sort. There are a lot of factors that come in. The one thing that we didn't have a chance to talk about is when you actually do choose a tool is what is your ramp up time? You know, are you looking at a ramp up time that is a couple of months? Are you looking at a ramp up time that's six months, eight months, something like that? You have to consider these things because if you're shopping for a tool or tools, analytic case management, you're shopping for them for typically a need that you have today. You're not shopping for a need you have in the future because you don't know what those needs are and the cost of those needs is going to vary depending upon what those needs are in the future. So there's a lot of pieces of that puzzle to, to consider. And for I think for us, one of the biggest things that we see, particularly with small plans, because we do a lot of work with smaller plans, is they don't have budgets like large and very large plans do, and they don't have the ability to do a lot of homegrown things that the larger plans do. Larger plans have the ability to create their own case management systems. They have the ability to create their own data analytic tools, which are probably as good as anything that's commercially <clears throat> off the shelf, right? They're very customized to their particular needs. And so you've got to be able to understand that from that small, from that small payer perspective, 
Um, not that I'm making this an advised sales pitch per se, but you know, we, we have conversations and consult with a lot of small plans about those types of needs because some of the tools that are out there are going to fit that bill. Some of those tools may not. I mean, I think it's a it's an individualized assessment that you have to do. We have vetted out uh, numerous tools that are out there and, and identified strengths and weaknesses amongst kind of all of them. And you've got to weigh that out. I don't think that there's one tool that will fit every single need that a plan has, um, but there are certainly going to be tools that are going to meet you know, more. You have to kind of think about the good, the bad, and the ugly. Does this tool fit the bill for what you need? Is it have the ability to be customizable? Number, number three is going to be, is it going to deliver the results that you need when you need them versus uh, turning on a spigot? That spigot can be very dangerous. So it's like, a, be careful what you wish for, right? I think the customizable part that you're talking about is super important too, because with all the different size um, SIUs or plans, um, not only just the sizes, but they might just have different focuses, different levels of expertise. So to to get a one size fits all like platform is is probably just not going to work for the majority of the you know even if you do research and you think you have a good idea of what the platform entails the ability to have it customizable, I think is is key because it, it's it's like taking something off the shelf versus getting a, you know, a fitted suit. It's that one right. size doesn't always fit all. So you gotta have that, you know, work with it for a month or two, work out the kinks, try and figure out, you know, what would work better for your specific unit, I think is pretty crucial. Right. And as someone who spent many years as a professional bodybuilder, you're intimately familiar with customizing your suits to fit you. Right. So uh, it's a good, very good uh, bringing it back. So, yeah, the, you know, the, the issue of technology, we could spend a lot of time talking about it. Our newsletter, um, our newsletter for this week has some information regarding the deployment of technology in your SIU. It's an important piece of the puzzle. Uh, you know, it, we're at this point now where plans plans cannot operate in the absence of having some sort of assistance from a technology perspective everybody talks about ai and ml and all of that i i don't i know enough to just know that the ai is uh, are two letters and ml are two letters um but you know you you really need to I, I guess i can go to chat gpt to have it tell me what ai and ml are um but you you know you certainly need to be able to do um an empirical analysis of what these different tools are create a, a little bit of a checklist if you're out there shopping for a tool what is the checklist going to have it's going to have things that are specific to your plan and the things that are important to your needs and your wants and when you're vetting these tools create a scorecard we've done that with some of the work that we did when we were looking for a tool and we do that with some of our homegrown analytics that we're doing so it's it's just a way to become cost effective and find the things that you need so we're going to keep that conversation going because technology is an integral part of SIU management. It's an uh, it's an integral part of SIU operations and payment integrity operations. So we'll continue talking about it probably in you know in the weeks to come. We haven't even talked about whether or not we're going to we're looking to integrate or is a plan looking to integrate other pieces into their case manager analytic tool, medical record reviews, for example, statistical sampling and things of that sort. There's a huge other area that's out there. Uh, that has to be thought about as to how you're going to handle some of those collateral case management pieces of the puzzle. So conversation will continue. Thanks as always, Matt, Wade, for your input. Uh, as uh, with everybody, we always appreciate you taking the time to, to join us on our weekly podcast. Uh, again, getting the newsletter is super easy. You can send us an email at hello at advise, A-D-V-I-Z-E, health.com. You can go up to our brand new refreshed and very attractive looking website that our web designer created. Uh, when you get up onto the website, you can sign right up for the newsletter there. And happy to say we've got our own web page. OIG roundtables on there. You can catch all of our previous OIG roundtables, which links right to our YouTube channel. And again, thanks everybody for tuning in and we'll see you on the next OIG roundtable. Thank you. Thank you.